Welcome. My name is Dave Kleinfelter. This is the seminar Best Practices for Effective Online Curriculum Development. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, so many of you join us today for this seminar. I'm the Chief Academic Officer at the Learning House. Uh, I noticed that a number of Learning House partners are on the call today. But uh, if you're not familiar with the Learning House, uh, we're a company that works with uh, about 100 colleges and universities throughout the United States, uh, providing back office assistance so they can do online programs, classes, and degrees. And uh, we do a series of women, uh, webinars like this one. Uh, those are archived on our website. So if you'd like to see some other webinars, I did one a couple of months ago about recruiting and developing faculty for online programs. You can go to our learninghouse.com a website that's there at the bottom of the page. And we'd like to invite all of you to come to a conference that we host uh, in Louisville, Kentucky each summer. This year it's July 10th and 11th called the Connect Conference. And uh, it's a live conference where you can meet people that are doing online programs and share with them. So information about that too is at the, at the website there at the bottom of the page. Before we jump into the uh, actual content today, I wanted to share with you a little bit about this gentleman, uh, Dr. Injetta. In 2009, he won the World Food Prize. Uh, this is given by a foundation in the state of Iowa to honor people who have contributed to solving world hunger, who have been able to uh, develop technology or other kinds of resources that allow you to uh, produce better food and help feed the the uh, population of the world. He won it in 2009 primarily uh, over work that he did to develop new strains of sorghum. Sorghum is one of the five major grains in the world and uh, heavily used in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. He developed a strain of sorghum that was uh, highly drought resistant so it produced much better uh, crops and then there's also a problem uh, with a parasitic plant, a weed called uh, striga, which uh, prevents the sorghum from growing as well. So he also developed a strain of sorghum that uh, is resistant to this parasitic plant. So again, yields go up. He's currently the distinguished professor of plant breeding and genetics and international agriculture at Purdue University. And uh, the interesting thing about this gentleman is uh, he grew up in a mud hut with a thatched roof in a small town, small village in Ethiopia. His mother uh, was committed to helping him get a good education and sacrificed to provide tuition for him to go to a school that was located 20 kilometers from his village. So every Sunday night he would hike through about 13 miles to get to the boarding school and then come home on Fridays. He did well enough in his uh, uh, elementary and, and middle school years that he was accepted to a high school uh, nearby that was sponsored by Oklahoma State University through a program with the USAID office. Uh, so an early form of distance education in this case. Uh, he did well in the, in the high school there and went on to a local college. And when he graduated uh, with his bachelor's degree back in 1973, uh, he got involved with a project that a Purdue researcher was doing in his country. This person was so impressed with him and his ability that he invited uh, this young baccalaureate degree holding a uh, student to come to Purdue to be his research assistant and that's when he, he earned his doctorate uh, a few years later, went to work for a research center and then eventually came back to Purdue on the faculty. So you can see kind of this gentleman coming full circle where he grew up in this small village subsistence farming family and uh, through the power of education, the opportunity to go to the right kind of high school and then come to the U.S. to a research university, uh, was able to develop uh, discoveries that uh, have been a blessing to millions of people throughout sub-Saharan Africa in terms of improving their food supply. And uh, 
he's going to use the money he won from the prize to create a foundation to help kids get an education. Well, this is an early example of distance learning. Uh, back in those days, in the 50s and 60s, when he went to this school sponsored by Oklahoma State, you had to actually travel back and forth to Africa. All of us, in one way or another, are involved in or thinking about doing distance education now we have access to the internet and so forth. But it's helpful, I think, whenever we uh, involve ourselves in a project like this to think about the ultimate outcomes. There are people in your communities, in areas around your universities and colleges, or maybe in other parts of the world that uh, need an education. Adults will take advantage of the education if you provide it online. They may not go on to win the World Food Prize, but they'll do good things in their community and their businesses and for their families. So I'm delighted that we're all working together in what I think is a very worthwhile endeavor to provide access to higher education uh, for a wide variety of people for one reason or another that can't go to traditional classes. So. A uh, number of universities uh, that you may be familiar with in recent years have grown dramatically in their online presence. Everybody knows about the University of Phoenix, founded in 1976, and today their online campus has over 300,000 students. They're the biggest of the, of the group. Another one that you may not have heard about is University of Maryland University College, much older institution, started as a division for continuing ed, became a an independent standalone university in the Maryland system in 1970, uh, primarily to serve adult learners over a distance or uh, in residential settings. Uh, UMUC has uh, just about 40,000 students enrolled today. There's a different type of institution. Indiana Wesleyan uh, was founded as a normal school to, to teach people to be teachers. Uh, in 1920, it was called Marion College, very small institution. In 1985, Indiana Wesleyan, though, this private independent institution created a Center for Adult and Professional Studies where they started doing off-campus programs and online programs. Today they have almost 16,000 students in their total enrollment. Another example similar is, Saint, is uh, Walden University. Walden was founded in 1970 as a for-profit institution, but 100% at a distance became online as the internet came around, but this is an example of a fairly old uh, for-profit institution that's been around for a long time and has always exclusively been online, never had a campus. Another example is St. Leo. Uh, this is an institution that was originally founded in 1890, but they struggled and closed their doors, reopened in 1959 built online programs in 1999, and today they have about 16,000 students between their campuses, their off-campus centers, and their online program. Here's a, a different example. Grand Canyon University was originally founded in 1949 as a nonprofit, independent college, liberal arts type college. It was purchased in 2004 by a for-profit entity and they began building online programs, and today Grand Canyon has uh, 37,000 students. Most of them are online students. And one more example, a little bit different type again, Southern New Hampshire University started as a for-profit uh, in 1932, but it's converted to nonprofit status in 1968, and in the last few years began building uh, online programs and now they have about 8,000 students between their campus in Manchester, New Hampshire and their online programs. So this screen shows you a wide mix of, of program, institutional types. Uh, some are for profit, some non-profit, some have switched back and forth either way, but they've all built substantial online programs and in many cases they've done this by developing some principles for new programs or adding new, new uh, degrees, new options to their range of programs. That's been a big reason why they've grown as they have. And then they've built interesting systems, I think innovative systems for course design. Those are the two main topics we're going to cover today, program development and course design. So let's start with uh, this concept of program development. Each of these institutions typically adds new programs every year. Some add quite a few. Uh, 
I recently worked for Walden University, and at Walden, we added 10 to 12 new, new programs every year. These aren't necessarily new degrees in each case, but they could be variations of a degree, like new concentrations or emphasis areas, or smaller programs like certificates. But a key part of their operation is to, is to add new programs. And so there's variations on this process, but typically four steps that, that they would follow. Uh, form an advisory board to help uh, plan the program and give guidance and insight into the outcomes of a, of a new program. Uh, some form of summit or planning meeting where they get together to kick off and conceptualize a new program. And then uh, a scope and sequence charts is the term that I use to describe this, but it's a way to see all of the courses laid out and how they relate back to program outcomes and relate to one another. And then finally, a class schedule. Uh, these are the kinds of things you need to think about and, and build to when you start a program. And these institutions that have grown rapidly have a formal system that they kind of take new programs through. And uh, we'll go through each one of these steps now in a little bit more detail. So the advisory board is critical. Uh, these are the kind of people you want to have on an advisory board to help you design a new degree or a new program. Practitioners are very helpful. Typically, the ones that uh, I think serve really well are uh, human resource vice presidents or people in charge of recruiting for businesses or industry in the field. These are the people that are hiring new students or new employees just out of college, and they have a good sense of what's needed in that business or in that industry, so they can give great insights into how you shape a program to prepare and develop people that will be highly desired by employers when they graduate. Representatives from professional associations are also very helpful. Uh, this last weekend, I was in Baltimore at the ACSB uh, conference. This is a programmatic accreditor professional association for business schools. And uh, like many of these programmatic accreditors or professional bodies, they have standards for bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. They outline the content that should be covered in the curriculum. So they're good sources. If you can have somebody come from the association, maybe a staff member, and join your advisory board, or have people that serve as evaluators, uh, visitors for that association that know the, the guidelines very well, they can be a good contributor to bring that, that viewpoint about what should be covered, the topics or content that should be in the program. Uh, we'll go back once more. External faculty. Uh, You'll obviously want to have some of your own faculty if you have faculty in the field. If it's a brand new field that you're moving into as an institution, you may not. But uh, even if you have your own faculty, I think it's very helpful to get a few faculty who are well known in the field from other institutions to be part of your advisory board. They bring a different perspective, a different view, and it's helpful to get a variety of viewpoints especially from the discipline specialist as you design and build a program. And they may have experience that they can share with, with uh, you as, as you're new in the field and they have a program already up and established. So these are the kind of people that you want on the advisory board. The advisory board is key when you first develop the program and create it, design it, and then they typically meet once or twice a year, sometimes face to face, sometimes by a teleconference to review their performance and, and see how the program is rolling out and continue to give advice about how the program may be revised or how you keep up to date with current topics in the field. Second step then in the, in the process of developing a brand new program is to have a summit of some type. And uh, in the institutions where I've worked, these have usually been two-day affairs, sometimes three days. You bring your advisory board to these summits, uh, academic leaders, the chair or, or program coordinator, the, and faculty, key faculty from your institution that are going to help manage this program and lead it. Uh, curriculum staff, like instructional designers, we'll talk more about uh, the use of instructional designers and curriculum folks in building courses, but they're a key component because they understand how to build courses and, and uh, 
the LMS that you might be using to deliver your courses. And I think it's also helpful to have enrollment marketing staff. These folks are going to have to recruit students for this program. They uh, have a sense of what might be attractive and how you can design that program and features you may put in it that may be appealing to potential students. So they're, they're a good resource to have at, at these planning summits. So what do you do at this summit? If you get these folks together for a couple of days, and the chart on the right there, you start with the outcomes. That's the most critical part of the program is to know what you're trying to, to produce in the graduates that come out. You start to design the courses, course descriptions at least, and maybe key outcomes of courses and how those courses lay out. In the scope and sequence, you'll see how the courses will be offered, first, second, third kind of thing, which are going to be prerequisites, where you fit in gen ed courses and electives. And then uh, also how they align back to program outcomes and then the class schedule. So we'll jump into this, uh, this set of four topics uh, in a little bit more detail here. So program outcomes. Uh, you want to get the outcomes right. As I said, you look at, at professional standards. You look at what the industry uh, leaders are expecting and desiring in graduates. There's been a case or two I've been involved with where you actually go out and track professionals in this field and, and follow them for a week or have them keep a survey a, a track of their own work so you get the, a sense of what's happening, what's important in this particular field. But uh, different sources you go to, but here's just some examples of uh, the kinds of outcomes. These aren't in any particular field, but just so you start thinking about it, sometimes you focus on key terminology and concepts in the field, key theories in the field. Uh, obviously, that would show up in many program outcomes or how you apply some of these things, the ethical standards that go with it. But uh, oftentimes, it's helpful to come to that summit with people having done homework where they've read the standards from the accrediting body if there is one in the field, where they've maybe looked at programs from other universities that are well known, so you have a sense of where you're going to start and what you want to accomplish. So after you get the program outcomes developed, then you start moving down to courses. And here's just some examples uh, where you would start to build the course descriptions, the key uh, outcomes or things you want to cover in each of those courses. You think about a typical undergrad program, you're going to have 40 courses in that program. Most places use three semester credit courses, 120 credits for a degree, so 40 courses altogether. Uh, the traditional way of looking at this is that a third of those courses would be general education, a third would be in the major itself, and a third would be open electives. Uh, there's been a tendency in recent years to keep expanding the number of courses in the major and, and reduce the number of courses that are electives. I think it's important that you try to resist this. Most of these programs will be designed to serve working adults, people who are coming back to school. And uh, many of them will have transfer credit. They'll have experiential credit that they could have earned through portfolio review. Uh, or if you're a friend, a adult friendly kind of institution, you'll maybe accept credit by examination. So typically these adult students come with transfer credit. They may have tried school a time or two in the past. And you want to have room in your degree plan for those transfer credits to come in and be counted because it's problematic if you make people take more than those 120 credits, they're wasting time and energy and so forth. So you want to build your course with enough electives in it to accommodate those transfer credits that they're going to bring. Uh, also, you have the issue where students maybe want to double major, or maybe students have particular professional goals that are unique to them where they want to get a major in one field and a minor or a concentration in another field because of a particular uh, goals that they have. So if you leave this program open with enough elective space in it, you can accommodate those students. My guidance and advice is to have the minimum number of courses that you need to cover the major, and that's all you require. Most students will take more than the minimum. They'll use those electives to go deeper into their major and take more, but if you prescribe that and require that, you really lock down the opportunities for a number of students, and you may uh, 
wind up making it difficult for students that have lots of transfer credit. So you'll think about as you lay these courses out, there's going to be 40 of them. Some of them will be kind of blanks because those are going to be general electives. Within the major itself, you may have 13 or 14 courses if you think of a third of them as courses in the major. And again, I think you should leave some of those as electives, maybe eight or nine required courses, core courses that everybody takes in the major, and then room for maybe a four course concentration. Uh, and as you plan your program and design the program, you want to think about are we going to offer concentrations and some electives in the major itself. If you start to add concentrations, you will start to split your population into smaller course enrollments towards the end of the program. So it's something to think about, especially as you're starting a brand new program. If it's not going to, if it's going to take a while to build the enrollments, uh, you want to limit the number of concentrations typically because uh, the students will split into these courses and you'll have low enrollment courses near the end of your program. Same thing with gen ed. You may have some university requirements where everybody takes certain gen ed courses like communications or composition. You may require some gen ed courses that tie specifically to the major, like a business major. Uh, they want that person taking business math or statistics for their uh, mathematics gen ed course. But you, again, you want to leave some electives in that gen ed pool so that people can fit in what they've taken before or take courses that have particular interest to them. This also helps when you start to build your class schedule that you'll have some flexibility that will help you keep your class sizes at a reasonable number. So anyway, lying out the, the set of classes you're going to teach, start to build in course descriptions and, and key outcomes in those courses is part of what you accomplish at this summit. And then uh, you go to this, yeah, we, I'm sorry, my colleague just said, make sure that I remind you folks that you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, I'm happy to have questions, and as you, as you key them in through the, uh, the chat room or the Q&A feature, we'll stop and I'll read those questions and respond to them. So feel free, if, if you have a question, I'm going past something you'd like to explore, to type in a question, and I'll pause and we'll answer those. Appreciate all the questions. So good, good reminder. Okay, so let's move on here. So as you finish building out this scope and sequence chart, uh, go back to your outcomes and put them across the top of this scope and sequence chart. So remember, the chart's going to get a lot bigger. It's going to have maybe 40 slots across it. And or you just focus in on maybe the major courses and how they tie back to these program outcomes. Uh, got a question here. Do you ever do any market research prior to program development? Hey, absolutely. Uh, that's a preceding step when you, I'll talk about this in another seminar, you know, a few months from now about strategies to build and develop, uh, grow your online programs. But uh, you're constantly looking for what programs may be good ones to offer in your particular market. And so a preceding program development that the academic folks would do, the marketing folks would be out there doing research, thinking about what and identifying programs that may be relevant and needed in your area that would be good programs for you to offer. So that's kind of an ongoing process. FYI, uh, we've commissioned, Learning House has commissioned a national marketing study, market research, about online programs. Uh, we've interviewed 1,500 of people that are either recently graduated currently enrolled in a program or planning to enroll within the next year and ask them a series of questions about what programs they're most interested in, how they find out information about uh, these programs, where they go for sources of data, what features they would like in an online program. We're going to present the results of that national survey at this Connect conference that I mentioned earlier and then we'll publish the results and they'll be available on our website. So that's a good starting point actually, it will be to see programs that may be considered or, or features in the programs. Good question. Uh, so back to the scope and sequence here. You lay the program outcomes across the top. You have the courses underneath. And look at the course 
outcomes. And the, key, the next step here is to check for alignment between your program outcomes and your course outcomes to make sure that they're synced up. So here's an example of how this could work. Sometimes you can color code it or use other schemes, but there's a program outcome about professional terms and you see at some of the courses here, there's a 100 level course where they're learning basic terms and then they're starting to use this terminology correctly in a 200 level course. So these course outcomes map back to or align with this one program outcome. Here's another example, the one about theories. Students learn to describe key theories early, then they move up a little bit higher skill level, compare and contrast, and maybe by a 400 level capstone, they're analyzing case studies from one theoretical point of view or, or something like this. So you can see how over the course of a program, if you lay it out and look comprehensively at the program, you can see how you're covering those program outcomes course by course by course. Now, some of you folks may be planning on taking a program you've already developed on your campus and moving it into an online uh, environment. So you may not want to do this complete new program design process, but I highly recommend you do a scope and sequence review like this. Lay your courses out, uh, the courses that are now in your major that you're planning on moving online, put the course, the program outcomes up there, and do this alignment exercise. See where your course outcomes tie back to and support those program outcomes. And I almost can guarantee you what you're going to find is that you'll have some program outcomes that are not well covered. Uh, sometimes when I've done this, you find program outcomes that are maybe covered in two or three early courses, and they never show up again anywhere in the program. Or you'll find that a program outcome that's only covered in one course, perhaps. Or an example here, uh, in the course itself, on the first one, course 101, you've got this, uh, this third outcome about parallels to personal experience. Sometimes you find what I, I call these dangling outcomes. They re relate to none of the program outcomes. They have nothing to do with the program outcomes, yet they're included in courses in the program. And you realize that's extraneous material. We should eliminate that. We don't need it. Uh, somebody thought at one time they'd put it in this course, but it's not really germane to what we're trying to do in this program. This is a very healthy process when you go through this curriculum alignment to make sure that your courses are teaching the things that you want to cover in the program. And you can see then uh, and ask yourself the question, if a student graduates and completes all these courses, will they really be prepared to do what we want them to do in this program and go out into the professional world and do good things? So it's a, it's a nice step. It helps you kind of review your program, whether it's an existing one or a brand new one and make sure that uh, you've got good coverage and it's well developed. Another thing you can do here as you, as you get deeper into this, in addition to course outcomes, you can add major course assignments or work products to this chart uh, for each of these courses. And you, you find again that you can help look at the program comprehensively and help prepare students for work to do. For example, you may have a 20 page paper that's a key project in an upper division course. You want to do some five page papers in earlier courses to get the students ready to do that. Or maybe you have an internship requirement or some kind of practicum requirement in a, in a course late in the program. We want to make sure that you prep the students to go out and do this so they've maybe studied ethical practices or good behavior in the workplace and so forth before you put them out on a, in a practicum type assignment. So viewing the whole program from start to finish comprehensively here really helps you feel and understand that you've got the outcomes lined up right and you're starting to develop assignments that may cross over several courses and they link and they support one another and it, ends up being the kind of good student experience that you want. So after you've done the alignment process, you've laid out the scope and sequence, you, you want to move on to the class schedule. It's important as a planner when you develop this program to think about how, how this class schedule is going to pay out, play out because one of the important things is to pay attention to is class size. If you get too small of classes, 
then you're going to lose money on a program and you may not be your your major goal may not be to make money but you don't want to lose money on these programs so you can do things to design the program and lay out the class schedule that really help you maintain a good class size and that's appropriate for each, indivi each individual institution to decide some smaller liberal arts colleges may want to keep focusing on that small class size of 15 students so there's plenty of student faculty interaction. Other institutions may be happy with class sizes of 25. Depending on your philosophy, you want to know what that target is and then help build your class schedule to meet that target. So here's a sample uh, of a, a sequence of classes. A program may start with a gen ed class, move to a class in the major that's a prerequisite for some other classes in the major. The three three classes, 102, 103, and 104 in the circle, sometimes referred to as a wheel, are all classes that can be taken in any sequence once you've had 101. And then from that wheel in this program, it leads to another wheel. It could lead to two or three courses in a row that are prerequisites of following courses. In this case, you're mixing in some gen ed electives with another major course, and they can take them in any sequence, but they take those courses after that first batch. Uh, so there's a couple principles to follow here. The first one is it's really helpful to start the first class in the sequence as a required gen ed class that's unique to the university that students won't transfer in. That way if you have students starting at different points throughout the year, you're always going to offer that class, but everybody's going to need that class, so they'll have a class to take. If you have a student that can transfer in that class, then they have to sit and wait for the next term to start before they can begin. Also, it's efficient because typically you'll have more than one degree or one program. You may have three or four programs all on that same start date, so all of those students will feed into this first gen ed class and make it a good, good sized class that's efficient. Uh, another key issue is to limit prerequisites. Prerequisites are important and helpful. They make sure that your students are prepared for the next set of material in the sequence, but you want to limit those as much as possible and make sure that they're really necessary because every time you put a prerequisite as kind of a choke point or a bottleneck where students have to go through that course before they can go on to another set of courses. If you string together five or six courses that are all prerequisites in a row and you start 15 students at the beginning, Students are going to get sick, they're going to move, they're going to drop out for different reasons. And as you lose students, uh, it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller. So by the end of that sequence, because they have to go through in that plain lockstep order, you may not, again, have enough students to really fill a class. So you want to be careful about the prerequisites. Uh, then you want to follow prerequisites to these groups of courses or these wheels that can be taken in any sequence because in this case if you have three courses in a wheel you'll have three cohorts of students that will enter that at different times but they'll all take the same course. I'll show you how this works in just a minute. So the more you can, and you can have four or five courses in a wheel, the bigger they are the better because has, there's more flexibility and it's also helpful to build in these electives because Students may have transfer credits and they don't need one of these courses. They could pop into an elective if it's being offered. So you want to decide too what's kind of the ideal process here. Is a typical student going to take one course a term, two courses a term, and you can build a class schedule then based on that ideal model. It's impossible to keep all your students on the same track because some of them will drop out, like I said, or stop out for a period of time. Some of them will have transfer credit. But you want to follow some principles like this so you have the best chance of keeping a good class size as well as having classes every time a student needs to take them and, and continue on their program. So here's what this looks like in an actual class schedule. This is a school that has maybe six starts a year. So you're going to have six cohorts. The first one begins in January and they take that gen ed class. Okay, so the first class of every one of these cohorts is going to be that gen ed class. You have to keep teaching it each term. Hopefully there's three or four other programs feeding into it so it's a good sized class. So the first cohort in March then moves to the first class in the major. Okay, that could be a, a low enrollment class depending on, how, depending on how many students started back in January. 
And then they hit the first course in this wheel in May, the major 102. Okay, so again, that one cohort is alone in that class. But see what starts to happen then. Uh, in cohort two, they started in March, did the gen ed, the major 101. And now because there's not a, they've met the prerequisite, they hit the first course in this wheel, but instead of 102, 103 is being offered this term. So they join the first cohort and they're mixed together in this class 103. The sequence is not critical here. Uh, then they go on another term in September, you're offering 104, and the cohort that started back in May also joins in. So you can see how you're feeding three cohorts of students into that one class. And if you look top to bottom in September, you only have to offer 104 and then the gen ed class and the other major class for the cohorts later on. So you can see how you get efficiency if you build these wheels in where courses can be taken in any sequence and you can feed multiple cohorts or entry points into that. Okay, program development. Uh, you've got a great program, you've organized it, laid it out, you've got this set of courses you want to build, now it's time to design your courses. And one of the great innovations, I think, in higher ed in the past 10 years as these institutions have built these large online populations is the concept of standard courses or master courses, where uh, you, you teach the same course over and over again. If you have five people teaching five sections of the course, they all teach the same course. Here's some of the reasons. First of all, you get this uniform student experience. You don't have, uh, when you say this is the course and we expect students to learn these things in this course, you can have pretty good confidence that that's what they're going to learn. If you let faculty members all design their own courses, pick their own textbooks, and do the kind of business as usual, you don't have a standard experience. It's hard to know if those students are really going to learn what you expect them to learn and what subsequent faculty and courses expect them to have covered. You also uh, get a quality control mechanism here. There are best practices. Some courses uh, are designed better than other courses. You can pull in the right materials and the right sequences and the right uh, concepts, and you have better quality in these courses because you can uh, build those features into these courses. And I think it makes better use of faculty. Some faculty are great course designers and kind of conceptualizers of courses. Some faculty are great teachers, and they're not always good at both of those. So you can find faculty who are great course developers, creative kind of individuals. They can build your courses. Other faculty can teach them. But separating this concept of course design from course teaching is, a, is critical to this process. And finally, it leaves room for continuous improvement. A little bit later, we'll talk about using assessment to drive improvement. And if you maintain a standard course or a master course, you can accomplish that. You can't accomplish that if you let everybody free for all and, and design courses differently. So teamwork is a, is a great concept. You have a faculty member who's a subject matter expert, instructional designers who really know pedagogy and know the LMS, maybe media specialists on the team who can build interactive activities, uh, video, animations, whatever. Sometimes an editor is part of this team because online courses are text heavy and the last thing you want is misspelled words and ungrammatical sentences and so forth. So it's a nice mix and I think you get a better product when you get these specialists with different areas of expertise all working together to build a course. Another important feature, I think, is for the university or the academic program to set some standards on how you're going to lay out these courses. Here's a typical course with a help center that appears on every page up in the top left. You have a menu down the left-hand side about how to get to common things like the library and the bookstore. And then this is the first lesson where you have a lecture, a reading assignment, a graded assignment. Look at this same course in a different format. A uh, help center has been moved, the library is in a bar now across the top. We're talking about reading activities instead of reading assignments, homework instead of graded assignments. It's really helpful for an online student, I think, for any student maybe, to have a constant template so that the help center is always in the same place. It's easy to find it if you need it. It's not confusing. Use common terminology like is it homework or is it reading? Uh, what's it going to be? You can design 
establish some basic standards like this to design all your courses to. And then as the student moves through the program, it's easier for them, it looks familiar, and it just makes it a better student experience. Now, actually building the course itself. Uh, Wiggins and, and Teague several years ago wrote the book Backward Design. It's a great book that uh, I highly recommend people take a look at. Uh, but it describes this process where you start kind of with the end in mind and work backward as you build a course. So you have a vision. You get your team together. It's kind of like a mini summit, like you did the program summit. Now you do a course summit, and you start laying out this course. You have maybe a course description and some outcomes that have been already determined in the program design summit. Uh, then there's maybe room for some negotiation here. Maybe the subject matter expert, this team, wants to modify those outcomes or those objectives a little bit. And so you work back with the department chair or the academic leader. But again, you don't want to mess up that scope and sequence chart. You want, don't want to throw a bunch of outcomes in this course that are already going to be covered in a course later in the program or in a course earlier. So it's helpful to look at that scope and sequence chart, see where this course fits into the overall pattern how the outcomes you're trying to accomplish here help to, to achieve those program outcomes and integrate across the, the curriculum. Once you get the outcomes nailed down that are important for students to learn in this course, the next step in the process is to design your assessments. How, what evidence will you take or will you accept or look at to know that the student met that outcome, that they're able to do it. You can check them off and say this person will perform well out there in the workplace or the professional setting. Part of the assessment, a key part, is also designing the rubrics that you'll use to assess that or grade that assignment so that uh, you get consistency. Uh, if five different people teach this class, they look at five different student responses, you all want them to give the same grade. And the best way to do that, especially with subjective assignments like written assignments or projects, is to develop a real tight rubric with examples and criteria spelled out so you can get consistent assessment. And students have confidence that they're being graded fairly and are being graded against those standards and the outcome. Then the last step in the process, yeah, somebody typed in inter rater reliability. Inter rater reliability is greatly improved with good rubrics. And it helps if you can to practice. And in a larger university where you have multiple people teaching the same course, it's a great idea to exchange assignments and let different people grade the same one from different classes or just to compare notes with faculty. Last step in the process is then where many people start, but it should be the final step, is actually getting learning resources. What materials will I use? Is there a textbook that matches up? Are there other written materials that are already out there? Or could we design some of our own materials? And that's where the fun begins in some respects. There, because Before we get to picking materials, I want to emphasize how when you follow this backward design process, you can build in this system for assessing student achievement and driving course improvement. So you have course outcomes on the left. Here's some sample assignments in the middle, quizzes, discussion forums, and so forth, and the number of points are worth on the right. If you just build a course this way, then you say, here's the linkage. This, this quiz ties back and is the assessment for outcome number one. This discussion forum assignment is really the assessment of outcome number four and so forth. You do this. Again, it's a little cur curriculum alignment process, just like you do at the program level. You do it at the course level. The important thing is you want to find the summative assessment. A quiz may be in there to help a student learn the material, so you don't want to use that as evidence of whether or not they mastered it. That's a learning tool. See where they are and get better. But you want to find the summative assessment for each of those course outcomes. Pick it out, identify it, and then uh, gather data on it. So. At the Learning House, we've built some tools to use with the LMS that, that we work with called Moodle. Most of the big LMSs have some kind of outcomes manager tool with them where you can capture this data, store it. So here's the same course, a fictitious set of data. In the fall term, course outcome number one, 75% of the students met that outcome at the level we wanted. So you can see how this plays out. As you accumulate this data in your system over time, at some point, you stop and you say, is it time to revise this course? 
And if I was going to revise this course, I would focus on course outcome number one. When you do this, you oftentimes see things that are kind of logical after the fact. Well, we introduced this concept too early, or the textbook doesn't do a good job on this concept. So you, there's clear ways, typically, when you can revise this course. And when you revise it, the majority of the time, you're going to see improvement, which is a great feeling. And it's what the accrediting bodies have been trying to get us to do for 20 years, but they spent too much time focusing on program outcomes if you get down to the course level and design your courses in a systematic way and hold them constant, you can actually do improvement of curriculum based on student achievement, and it's a very good process. It gets better over time. So uh, I thought we had a question there, but we're going to answer it by a text because uh, it's kind of specific. So that's how you do assessment. Let's look at materials then. One of the nice things about living in the age that we do is there's tons of materials being developed in the open uh, education resource movement that you can use that are free. So Wikiversity, here's some for textbooks. Wikiversity is a place where people can contribute to textbooks. So if you go to their site, you'll find some really interesting books being developed. They may have hundreds of authors each contributing their expertise, and they're pretty interesting quality materials that may be useful in a class that you're building. Another example is Flat World Knowledge. This is a publisher that will work with universities to publish books. They then make their books free uh, at a certain level. If you want a printed copy or colored copy, the student pays a, a premium for that. But most of their books are free for use and are already on available in electronic format. Rice University just announced uh, that they're writing five textbooks that are going to be open resource books. They have good authors. They're going to do a review process and produce these five books in very heavily subscribed common classes in U.S. universities. Uh, another good resource is Agate Publishing. This is a publisher that will work with you to publish your own books. It's not exactly open resource, but sometimes if you have high enrollment classes, publishing your own book with your own faculty makes a lot of sense, and they can help you do that well. Finally, a good resource, the University of Minnesota just announced that in their library they're going to collect a collection of open resource textbooks that have been peer reviewed. So you have some kind of quality control, but it's one place you can go and find hopefully all the textbooks that are out there, open resource that have been peer reviewed. Moving on to, we've got a question here. Uh, so how do you feel higher learning commissions are requiring this detailed level of course assessment presently? Uh, I think I understand the question. All of the six regional accreditors are, uh, have for 20 years now expected and, and promoted assessment of student learning as a way to improve curriculum. They've had this standard for, for a long, long time. Very few universities and colleges have ever been checked off as having met this standard because it's really hard to do if you don't have a consistent set of courses or a curriculum over time. And uh, my experience is that the, that the various accrediting bodies, like the Higher Learning Commission, would be delighted to find institutions that have this master course concept and a built-in systematic gathering of data, using it then to make improvement to courses over time. It's kind of the gold standard for the accrediting bodies. Let's move on to look at some instructional materials then. Interesting sites. OCWC is the Open Courseware Consortium run by MIT. All of the MIT courses are there. They're all free. You can look at them, use materials. Many other universities have also contributed. TED-Ed is a very interesting uh, website. Go there, and uh, there's a way that faculty members, teachers can contribute videos. Professional designers from around the world contribute design elements to lessons, and they jointly build lessons. And they have a little platform where you can add quizzes and other kinds of materials, and they're building this collection of teacher-made, faculty-made, designer-built <laughs> Really high quality, interesting lessons. Uh, great concept. You can contribute your lessons and use other people's. Google Art is an example of new technology coming into this space that people can use. This is a collection of some of the thousands of the world's most popular or important paintings. And they're photographed in their location in a museum where they currently hang somewhere in the world. 
And you, using this site, you can zoom in on these pictures, focus on very narrow parts of the painting, back up and look and see where it sits in the room, where it hangs in the museum. And you get a three or four minute video from a noted art critic explaining that painting. What a wonderful resource if you're teaching art appreciation. Pin History is another very interesting site I came across recently. Uh, again, it's a free site where they encourage people to develop history lessons. They encourage people anywhere in the world to take photographs of historical interest of their town or their home or their location, pin it on a Google map, and then add a description of what it is. And so you go to this site, you can find all kinds of interesting things and the pictures to go with it about towns all over the world. And the Khan Academy, most of you probably heard about. Uh, this, again, a free site where they create videos explaining basic math concepts. Uh, it gets millions of hits every day as students and faculty go there to use these resources to teach math concepts. So there's tons of resources out there, more being developed, lots of venture money pouring into these new startup companies, all creating different ways to create materials that you can take advantage of when you design programs. I have a question about are you including NK accreditation in those you mentioned? That body requires all the assessment, course evaluation, standard course, so that course, uh, course X is course X no matter who teaches it. I don't know NK really well. I've worked in several universities that were NK accredited. It seems like that accrediting body is kind of more advanced in terms of specifying more specific outcomes that they want to see and how you assess those outcomes. So I would say NK is probably a little more specific and advanced than uh, uh, than the regional accreditors are. Uh, here's a comment too that the Khan Academy has much more content than just math. They started out in math, but that's right. And, and lately, they've added content in other areas. These these videos that are there for particular concepts. We got to keep moving. Uh, so you can also design your own instructional materials. This is where it helps to have an instructional designer or media people on the team that are building. Here's just a couple of low-level examples of kind of interactive materials that you can create. These are flashcards that we built for a course for one of our partners. It's, on, it's a health science course having to do with parts of human anatomy. So this flashcard, if you hit the middle button, flips over, you can see the answer. You can go left to right. So it's a good way for a student to quiz themselves on parts of the body. Another example of this is you, you get these two figures. And if you drag the term at the top to the right location, if it's correct, it'll stay. If it's wrong, it'll pop back. Again, these are kind of low-level interaction activities. If we had time, we could show you more complicated ones. But this is a little bit more interesting learning than just, OK, he studied this diagram. And so you can build these kinds of materials with the right people on your design team. Uh, the quality ru rubric is an example. This is the one that we use at Learning House. But it's patterned after one built by an organization called Quality Matters, which is dedicated to uh, effective online courses. And you can use this then to design your courses to meet these uh, this rubric, you can also use it afterwards to assess your courses. So here's an example of the kinds of data you may gather and look at as you review your curriculum. Student satisfaction ratings from your end of course survey, retention rates within the course, the student achievement that we, I mentioned earlier, if you build that system, the quality review using the rubric just preceding this. If you have multiple faculty teaching, it's great to have them rate the course and give suggestions and look at grade data. You look at all this together and you gather this regularly, you have a good view of what's going on with this course and, again, ways to improve that course or build that course over time. Last thing that I think is important once you've designed that great program and you've created wonderful courses to go with it is keeping track of all this stuff. So a good content management system is an important piece to have in place if you're going to build to any kind of scale or have multiple programs. It gives you an inventory of these different learning objects that you've created. Some of those can be repurposed in other classes. And as you, if you go with this master course concept, you want to have version control. So the course was this way for these many terms, and we changed it. Here's 
version two of the course, for example, it's helpful to have a content management system where you can keep track of all those. So a course, in many ways, can be similar to a textbook. A textbook that goes through multiple editions gets better over time. And because you get feedback about that, it gets updated, you kind of test it out. It's helpful for me to think about courses just like textbooks. It's a major investment of a university, and they own that course, and it can get better over time as you teach it, get feedback about it, assess the performance of that course, make changes in it using this team of people and the assessment data from student achievement. So wonderful concept uh, to create these courses and keep building them so they get better to create that good student experience and layer them up into a program that uh, really helps your graduates perform once they go out into the workplace. We've got a few minutes here for Q&A. Fire some questions at me. We're going to stick around for the next half hour. If people have questions they want to post, we can sure talk about those. But uh, give you a few minutes here. If uh, you have particular questions, uh, type them in. Question came in that somebody enjoyed the presentation and will be will it be available for others. We'll keep a, we have a copy of it. We've recorded it. Uh, each of you that were, were signed up today will get a copy of it. You can share it. It'll also, as I said, be posted on the Learning House website. If you go to the website, you can find it. If you want to share it with a colleague, uh, feel free to. How do we get a copy of the quality review form you mentioned? Uh, we would be happy to share with you the Learning House version of the quality review form if you would email me uh, or email the people that's, that you, were you contacted. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so Troy, I'll, we'll send you my email address. You email me, I'll get it back to you. You can also go to the Quality Matters website. This is a professional association. Uh, and you can get a copy of their form there, and ours is based on it. Here's a good question. How can master courses be flexible enough to respond to current events? Uh, depends on, well, two, two ways you would do that. Uh, when you build a master course, one of the things you need to think about is how much latitude will the faculty member have to add materials to that course. It's fairly common for institution to say you can't change the outcomes, you can't change the assessments, the key assessments, and you've got to use maybe this textbook. But aside from that, faculty members are typically encouraged to bring their own ideas, other resources, their own lecture notes, and so forth to that class. So that's a good way that you can cover maybe a, a fast-moving event that just happened, like the election in Egypt the last couple of days. In a political science course, you might want to talk about that, so a faculty member could add that to the course in terms of a reading assignment or uh, resources to share. Then you also you have to decide how often are you going to revise this course. A major course revision uh, probably doesn't happen more than once a year where you bring your team back together and, and look at all the data about that course. Uh, but smaller revisions can happen depending on the, the leadership at the university, how often they want that to happen. Uh, another question, how do we get copies of the rubric? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how do we get copies of the rubrics? Oh, if you're talking about the quality matter rubrics, uh, if you would, we'll respond to, to this, uh, you on the email and, and give you the email address to write to and I'll send you a copy, okay? Uh, oh, this is one of our relationship managers here saying you can, if you're, if you're a Learning House partner institution, you can get it from your relationship manager. They'll be glad to send you a copy. And uh, here's a course. How do you handle faculty concerns about intellectual property rights? Does the university own the master course? Typically, the university would own the master course. I've come across a few that give some royalties to the faculty member who designed it. 
uh, oftentimes the faculty member will be paid for that piece of work, so it's clear that the university owns it. They were paid for the work that they did and so forth. So th that could go either way. Uh, and so the university has the rights to it. Now, you've got to follow all the, the rules of copyright and so forth as you design that course. There were a couple references as the screens went by there about materials. Uh, because we've published a book, the Learning House published a book that covers that in pretty good detail that you can get a copy of if you would like. So uh, it's a good question. Uh, here's one. What was the author of the book, Backward Design? Grant Wiggins is the lead author. And then uh, Teague, T-I-G-A-G, -G, is the second author on that book. It was published, second edition, in 05, 2005. And uh, in your experience, what is the typical load for faculty teaching online? And what is the typical length of time for an online course? Or does it just depend? Uh, most of the institutions that we work at the Learning House don't make a distinction between online load and face-to-face -face load. A, a class assignment is a class assignment. So if they have a policy of four classes a semester, that could be three face-to-face -face and one online. Uh, in some of the for-profit institutions where I've worked, the typical faculty load is heavier because they use this master course concept exclusively. So the faculty member is not expected to design the course. The, the workload for the faculty member is lower in that sense, that uh, they don't have to pick textbooks, they don't have to write exams, they don't have to do all that work to build a course. They're given the course. They can supplement, but they teach it. So they have heavier teaching loads, maybe 12 or 14. And they usually run year round. So a faculty member may teach 12 or 14 or 15 courses as part of their standard load, uh, where they don't have to design the course, but just teach it. And uh, typical length of time for an online course, it varies dramatically, anywhere from four or five weeks up to the typical 16-week semester. It's fairly common more and more, and, and I would recommend an eight-week term. Adult students like to go a little bit quicker and see progress. An eight-week term is half of a semester, so it calculates out pretty well. And you can run six terms a year then. Six times eight is 48 weeks with weeks in between. That's a good schedule for an online program. Adult learners don't want to wait two or three months to start once they decide to go. And if you're only running three terms a year, like three 16-week traditional semesters, you'll lose student enrollments. So eight weeks is a good kind of middle point that many, many institutions are using, although there is no standard. A lot of good questions here. I see people starting to drop off, which is great. Thank you for coming. and. Uh, Again, I'll stick around for a few minutes. If there's other questions that come in, I'd be glad to respond to them. How about a typical class size for online programs? Again, it varies by institution. A smaller independent liberal arts college may want to limit it to 10 or 15 because they really value small classes. Other institutions may say 20 or 25 is fine. Uh, I can tell you that, well, there's an academic and an economic issue here. As I said earlier, if you don't build your schedule right, you'll get lots of small enrollment classes, and it's not a good feeling to lose money consistently because you only have three or four or five students in a class. So scheduling is important to build the reasonable class size there. I have done research, kind of controlled research, where we looked at the same class being taught the same term and different size limits, anywhere from 30 down to 15. And we could get no significant difference between student satisfaction, student performance, student retention rates based on class size. It just doesn't show up that we've seen. One concern that you know faculty load is important, if that class gets too big and there's lots of grading to do, you think about compensating your faculty differently. There's also a problem, though, if the class gets too small. A discussion forum participation tends to lag if there's only half a dozen or 10 students in a class. So you have a more robust uh, discussion if you have 15 students or 20 in a class. So uh, 
Uh, you want to think about that from both ends. But most of the clients that we work with, our partner institutions would would shoot for around 15. I think is pretty common number that that, that fits right. Will the research that you conducted with online learners be available after the Connect conference? Would like to hear about the results, but unable to attend. Yes, we'll give a presentation, kind of the publishing of the results at the conference, but then uh, the written report will be available via our website. So uh, you, you could look there after July 11th. How do you increase the class participation for discussion questions? What is the best way to handle those individuals? Whoa, uh, that's a big question. I think the discussion forum is kind of the heart and the soul of an online class. And a great discussion forum really gets student interaction and the ability for the faculty member to help that student dig deeper and probe into content. So it's a real skill. I think the key skill of an online faculty member is to lead that discussion forum and prompt students. Uh, and so part of it, I mean, the easy answer is make it a graded assignment where they have to do it to earn points. The better way to do it is to have great faculty members who are probing and stimulating. So if a student makes a comment on the discussion forum, how you react to that comment is critical. You want to do it in a supportive, positive tone. If the student has missed things, you want to be able to encourage that student maybe to go back and check out the reading assignment or to think about another point of view. Uh, it's nice to get two students responding to one another and encourage that kind of interaction between students. It's important, I think, for the faculty member to be in that discussion forum on a very consistent basis to stimulate that thinking and questioning and push the students to explore deeper. Uh, so again, the presentation I did a month or so ago on best faculty practices says you'll set expectations. Faculty members should be in that discussion forum at least four days a week. Five would be better. And they should be engaging in a certain way. It's not good enough just to say, nice job. You want to say that was a good response, but did you think about this and this and this? And I really recommend you read this, that kind of thing. So discussion forum is a really important question. Also, you know, how you design the course, if you design great questions, interesting materials that get the students thinking, then they're going to have something to write about. They're going to want to participate and see what other students have to say about their ideas. It's a really good question, important one. We're choosing a new LMS from Angel. Are there LMSs that you work well with besides Moodle? Uh, the Learning House works exclusively with Moodle. We like Moodle because it's a very robust uh, LMS and it's open source, which means it's free. Uh, and we support it. We've added add-ons and plugins, so we feel very comfortable with Moodle. Although uh, there are lots of LMSs out there, they all do basically the same thing. It's really a matter of cost in some cases. But uh, we don't work with, uh, with other LMSs at this point in time to provide our services. Uh, as an organization. But I wish you well with Angel. I hope it does a good job for you. Oh, you're, oh maybe the, you're going from Angel to a new LMS. Maybe I misinterpreted the question. Uh, so if that's the case, uh, by all means, adopt Moodle. It's a good one to use. Uh, although I've worked on different institutions that have used different LMSs. And again, they all do pretty much the same thing. Here's a question. Uh, what do you do when you have done all you can to encourage students that are falling behind or failing a class to get the additional help they need, even though you made yourself available to them? That's the hardest thing for a faculty member and the most discouraging, you know. You're putting your heart and soul into this class and the students aren't showing up, you know. They, they show up for a little bit and they drop out or they kind of engage and disengage and you reach out to them. 
I've known faculty that call on a regular basis, try to do all kinds of things to reach out to that student. At the end of the day, they're responsible for their behavior. You want to do everything you can to make that class interesting and dynamic and relevant for the career they want to go to. You want to remind them that they're enrolling in this class to get a better life for themselves, you know, and a better job at the end. But, you know, they're adults. You can't control their behavior. So you give it the best you can and, and then move on is what I would say. So do you, in effect, uh, host Moodle? We are on Angel and looking to move too. We are a small and couldn't support Moodle alone. Yes, that's why the Learning House was actually formed. Uh, it was it developed in, originally by a professor at the University of Louisville about 11 years ago who was a good online faculty member himself, and he started working with smaller colleges in central Kentucky, and uh, they started hosting on Moodle. So right now, the Learning House provides an array of services for an institution that wants to do online courses and programs. That starts with hosting Moodle. We have very stable, secure, 99.9 percent, .9 you know, uptime and an IT staff that provides additions to Moodle and enhancements as well as a 24-7 help desk so faculty and students can get help if something doesn't work right or they need guidance on it. Then we also have a curriculum department that works with faculty members to build courses. So this whole concept I just talked about, about a team of people working on a course, typically it's a professor from the college or university and instructional designers and media people from Learning House that partner up to build those courses. There's also a training department that, that teaches faculty members best practices on how to teach online, like I was just talking about how to handle a discussion forum, and how to use Moodle and so forth. We have consulting services that uh, help with enrollment management. We have a marketing division that will help with marketing programs and a retention department that helps schools learn how to or we would provide the service that, to have success coaches or academic advisors that do a retention. So basically a school that wants to start online programs can get into it with very little upfront investment. You don't have to go out and hire IT people to run Moodle or faculty trainers or curriculum people. We have those staff. And because we can do it at scale, we can do it much cheaper than you could having to staff up all those positions yourself. So it's a good service. That's why I joined the company about six months ago, because I thought that there's a lot of opportunities for independent colleges and public community colleges and universities. And Learning House had the whole set of services that you needed after working in some of these large online for-profit universities and learning what they did there. So uh, here's another question, good question. If you have anything regarding faculty development and retention, I would be interested. Please feel free to contact me. This would be on ground as well as online campuses. Uh, we do have, we do have uh, uh, services in those areas. So we'll respond with an email directly to you. Uh, here's a. Oh, this is somebody that, I don't know if I see the whole question. Oh, what do you recommend to get more online faculty positions when you do not have a PhD? Is it more beneficial to have a PhD? Yeah, absolutely. Many universities set that as a standard that you have a terminal degree or a PhD in your field. So if you don't, you're going to be limited to, to institutions that don't require that and more and more do. And frankly, there's a lot of people that want to teach online. I, I mentioned this in the previous seminar that I did about faculty. Uh, retired faculty, faculty moonlighting, professionals that want to do something on the side, they enjoy teaching, stay-at-home moms who are out of the workforce for a while. There's a whole big source of online faculty that want to do it part-time, and many of them are very well qualified, both academically and professionally. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there that want to teach online. Competition can get kind of tight. So having a PhD is pretty important. Here's a question. If our university won't let us move to Moodle, can we still work with the Learning House? 
Uh, we need to talk about that. We only host on, on Moodle, so that could be a barrier. Uh, although we oftentimes work with universities that have one learning management system for their campus courses where they do blended uh, courses and kind of do a little bit for their on-campus students. And then they may want to do a whole program online, like a master's degree in this field or that field that they can host on Moodle, and so they, both platforms can operate very symbiotically for different purposes, and the students don't have to mix back and forth. So uh, we would be happy to visit with you a little bit more about your particular circumstance. But we do it all the time. We do it regularly, where there's two different platforms in operation. But we only work on Moodle as a company. Could you give me information? Oh, yeah. Well, the person that was interested in a PhD, uh, there's a number of really good online PhD programs, more and more coming out. As I mentioned, I used to work at Walden. I was the chief academic officer there. Walden has a full array of PhD programs and professional doctorates in a number of fields. Capella is another good example of an online university that has doctoral programs. And there are other ones out there. Those are ones that I know about pretty well. So that's the best place for professional development is go get that doctorate degree if you don't have it. Looks like the questions are starting to slow down. I hope we haven't missed any and that we've answered ones that you have. Again, uh, if you have further questions or issues, uh, you can go to the website and uh, you can get my contact info there. Feel free to contact me personally. But thank you for coming today. It's great to, to have your participation. And uh, I wish you well in the work you do to, to build online programs and provide more access for people who uh, do good things with their degrees. Thank you very much. Thank you.